Hey everybody, this is Instructor Beats again with the teacher resource video. This time we're going to be talking about adding rigor to math using depth and complexity. My voice may sound a little different. I'm the other half of Instructor Beats. I'm the guy singing pretty terribly, trying to hit notes that are too high for me. Mr. B, who usually does instructional videos, he's the dude rapping. So to get started, um, our agenda for today, we're going to define depth. And then we're going to cover a couple of examples um, where depth has been added into some math problems. Um, this is not my first take in recording this video, so I know how long it takes. Um, so I'm probably going to do a, another video on the other examples I have in this slide um, PowerPoint. And then we'll do another follow-up video that goes into complexity and complexity um, in math. So to get started, what is depth? Uh, depth is really just moving from concrete to abstract, from tangible to intangible. And when we took coursework to become teachers, oftentimes they told us in math that is uh, concrete means manipulative, it's physical things that kids can manipulate to explore concepts and understand concepts. Um, then when we move more toward abstract, we start representing things pictorially with illustrations. And then when we're finally full-fledged abstract, really deep, we're using equations, we're using numbers and symbols to represent math concepts. Um, but I'm going to tell you, that's not really depth. That's what we expect everybody to be able to do. Um, and if I were to show you a math problem that is completely abstract well there's one one plus two one plus two equals three that's not really deep um, so we're going to get into that further also depth goes beyond just determining facts one plus two equals three that's a fact uh, at this point in time we all just know that um, and then the concept of addition we all understand how addition works um, but can we go deeper can we force students to use their understanding of these concepts and make generalizations, um, come up with statements about addition that are always true or about multiplication that are always true? Like, for instance, if I multiply an even number by any number, the product is always going to be even. That's a generalization. Um, can we force students to use their understanding of those things? as they explore those facts and concepts. Um, so that's the definition of depth. What does it look like in math? And so I pulled out these three points from my own just experimenting. And the first suggestion is remove information. Remove all the information you can. As long as that information can be inferred, remove it. Just make sure the problem is solvable. And so. That means that you're probably going to have to attempt to solve it and, and see if it actually works. And that may take an extra minute or two. Um, but I think what you can create just by removing information will challenge the students and engage them. They love it when you're able to give them um, puzzles, make them curious about it. Um, something that they understand they can solve um, and all the information is not given to them. So it's like a mystery. Uh, the second suggestion is use literal equations. I mean, uh, right in third grade, they're understanding that length times width equals area or perimeter of a rectangle rectangle uh, is all the sides added up together. So they understand literal equations at an early age. Use them, but don't just give them the value. Don't just write a rectangle and give them the the length and the width and and say find the area uh, because in that case they're really just multiplying some numbers um, give them complex shapes that utilize quadrilaterals uh, and use congruencies so that they have to figure out or find those values elsewhere um, and I'm going to show you an example with volume um, later using literal equations to infuse depth into your math and then finally Force those students to use generalizations like we were talking about earlier. Um, force them to use their understanding about the concept of regrouping in order to make 
um, in order to solve problems. And so with these three suggestions, uh, I have some problems here that we can take a look at. Um, we're just going to go ahead and take a look at probably this dr plus dr plus dr plus dr equals md problem and maybe this volume problem uh, because magic squares uh, I need to set up you know the understanding of what a magic square is uh, so let's just get straight into it so in this problem here I have dr plus dr plus dr plus dr equals md and the question is what what digits do d r and m represent now, this D exists in the tens place, which already limits some options for me. Um, obviously, this D is in the tens place. It can't be a number like 100. Um, and it also can't be 2. Um, I'm not 2. It can't be 0 because we're not going to represent a number like 9 as 0, 9 in math. Although Mr. Butler will argue with me and say, well, when we're doing long division, you want to make sure that you put a zero above the blah, 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 blah. That's a whole nother thing that we'll talk about later. So in this problem, D plus D plus D plus D, this D is really limited to just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. D can't be 10 because that's regrouping into the hundreds place. I'm limited to just these digits. And when I look at the sum of DR plus DR plus DR plus DR, I'm left with MD. And M is a digit in the tens place. None of this regroups to the hundreds place. So D then couldn't be 9 because... 9 plus 9 plus 9 plus 9, or 4 9s, make 36. D can't be 8, because that would be 32, and it regroups. That would be 320. D couldn't be 7. That would be 28 or 280. That regroups into the hundreds place. It couldn't be 6. That would be 24. 5, that would be 20. 4, that would be 16. Or 3, that would be 12. I'm really just left with the possibility of D being 1 or D being 2. Now, if I were to go through and guess and check and say, okay, what if D is 1? In the sum here, my 1's place is D as well. So in my 1's place, I would have a 1. I would need to figure out what is R. Now, using another generalization that we talked about earlier, I have four R's r plus r plus r plus r or four groups and r could be a group of two if r is two then that's four twos or four times two r could be one r could even be zero because it's in the ones place um r could be any of these things but because there are four r's and i could look at this as four times anything I know that my product is always going to be an even number. Four zeros is zero. Four ones is four. Four twos is eight. Four threes is 12. Four fours is 16. Um, never will I get a one in the ones place. So I could use that generalization and automatically understand that D cannot be one because four R's will never make a one in the ones place. Or I could do exactly what I did for D and I could go through every possible digit zero through nine and come up with the same, the same conclusion. So D cannot be one. In this case, D has to be two. And so from here, I just need to figure out, well, what digit is R that makes a two in the ones place? I know it couldn't be zero because four zeros is zero. Couldn't be one because four ones is four. Couldn't be two because four twos is eight. But it could be three because four threes is 12. I would have a two in the ones place. And even if I regroup 
12. I have a 10 to regroup. 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 equals 9. I'm not regrouping into the hundreds place here. M can equal 9. So R must be 3. And if I add 23 plus 23 plus 23 plus 23 plus the 10 that regroups, well, it would regroup because all the 3s are part of that. Anyway, it'd be 92. 4 23s equal 92. So that there shows you how you can eliminate information that can be inferred. And you can also for students to use generalizations about regrouping or about multiplication in order to solve problems. This is an addition problem that has no numbers at all. Um, so moving on. So here is a rectangular prism. And yes, we're forcing students to use a literal equation. They need to know length times width times height equals volume. Um, they're missing the height but they do have the length and width given to them and they do have the volume given to them. Um, so all they need to do is figure out, well, what's the base? 300 times 150. And then from there, they know that, okay, so base times this height equals 900,000. So if they just use a fact family, division fact family, they could say 900,000 divided by the base equals the height. And it would just be a quick calculation, and they would understand that the height then is 20. Now, you could do that, or you could give them a scenario. This scenario pushes some complexity um, concepts, but you're going to see that this is also taking out information. So we're talking about depth um, and using a literal equation. Uh, so it says Bank of America is planning to build a new building. The building will be a rectangular prism. If the short side of the base is x feet, the long side of the base is 2x feet. So we don't know the short side. We don't know the long side. Information's been taken out. The short side of the base is the same length as the southeast exterior wall of the Bank of America Financial Center, round to the nearest 10. So now I need to find this information elsewhere. Southeast exterior wall of the Bank of America Financial Center, um, which we're talking about the one in Uptown Charlotte. And so here's the Bank of America Financial Center. And there's a really cool feature here. I'm going to just go ahead and clear this measurement. Um, I actually found this out uh, fighting a speeding ticket in court, which is kind of fun story, but maybe for another time. Um, if I want to find the, here's the south east exterior wall of the financial center, I can zoom in to the corner and you want to make sure that you do zoom into the corner and you kind of center it um, because if you were, you know, going from way out here, that perspective, you may think you're right clicking a particular area, which actually that's not bad. It's right where I wanted it. Um, but you probably may be missing that uh, corner by a few feet. So when you right click, um, click measure distance and go to the other corner you want to measure to distance to here. So you can see the distance here says 150.87 feet. And if I round to the nearest 10, then that short side is 150 feet and that's x x equals 150 feet i know the long side is 2x and so 2x is just double that or 300 feet and now the volume of the building is expected to be 900 uh, cubic feet now the question isn't what's the height of the building question is how many floors does the building have so I could figure out the height pretty easily the height is 20 um, but that's not what the question is now if you haven't watched our sides check uh, video the song or the teacher resource video um, you may not know but we like to have our students make a statement before they even attempt to solve a problem 
And so by writing out the statement, they know what they're looking for. And in this case, they're looking for the height, yes, but they're going to want to convert that to floors, which may take additional research. It may take a Google search, perhaps, um, which, again, is pushing into complexity. But you can see how deep this problem is by eliminating information and forcing them to use a literal equation um, and then having multiple steps in order to solve. So how many floors does this building have? Well, the height is 20 feet. And with a quick Google search, I may have found that uh, typical construction, one floor is about 10 feet. So how many floors? Two. So this, this, these two examples here show how you can remove information that can be inferred as long as the problem is still solvable. This was still solvable. Um, you can force them to use generalizations, their understanding about regrouping, about multiplication. Um, and you can also force them to utilize literal equations, but without you giving them the length of the sides. So those are just a couple examples. In the next video, um, I'm going to go ahead and finish off the rest of the examples. Uh, for now, be sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel which you're already there because you're watching this video, but we're found at Instructor Beats Official, or you can go to, not or, and you can go to our Instagram at Instructor Beats and follow us there. Um, until next time, go ahead and try to add some depth into some of your problems that you already have for your particular unit. Um, and we'll see you soon.